Hi, welcome to today's webinar, Learn How to Make Money in Today's Landscape, Selling Luxury Travel. I'm Paloma Villaverde de Rico. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Recommend Magazine, and I'll be moderating this webinar. And this webinar has been made possible by Recommend, as well as Explore Journeys and Seaborn. It's a complement to the Luxury Travel Trends survey that was conducted on Recommend.com, as well as the Luxury Travel Trends Report, which will be sent to you in the follow-up email. During this conversation with our esteemed panelists, we'll speak about luxury travel trends and how COVID-19 has impacted what travels are seeking when it comes to luxury travel. Before we begin, though, a few housekeeping items. During the presentation, feel free to enter your questions in the question box. We'll gather them together and hold a Q&A after the questions, my questions. Don't worry, if you miss something, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link via email to access the recording at your leisure. And as I mentioned, a link to the Luxury Travel Trends Report will be included in the follow-up email. So let's start the webinar by having the panelists introduce themselves. Susan. I'm Susan Whitson with King & Whitson Travel. We're an independent affiliate of Brownell Travel, which is a virtuoso agency. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Diana. Hi, I'm Diana Heckler, president of Detours Travel. That's a small boutique luxury sh uh, shop in Larchmont, New York, outside of New York City. And we are proud members of the Ensemble Travel Group. Thank you, Diana. Thanks for joining us today. And Lainey. Hi, I'm the owner of uh, Dream Vacations in the Westlake Hills area of Austin, Texas. Um, my name is Lainey Melnick, and um, I am affiliated with Travel Leaders, but Dream Vacations is a franchise. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today and for providing all of your insight on luxury travel. So let's jump right into the questions. So what is your current state of mind, Diana, I'm going to hand this over to you, when it comes to the travel industry, when it comes to selling luxury travel? What's happening on the front lines right now? I'm optimistic, I have to say. Um, I would say about four weeks ago, my, the dam began to break and my phone began to ring. And people are traveling even this fall. This morning, just before the show, I got an email from someone else who says she wants to go to Florence in February for a an art show that's occurring there. I have a bunch of people who've traveled this fall, very short notice, um, but wanted to go, who, who said things like, I want to, I have to get out of Dodge. You know, people are desperate to travel and the luxury market, I think, is going to come back faster than ever. And that's even independent of all those credits on the cruises, which are sitting there, which is also nice. You know, that's ahead of us. But I see a lot of people signing up and saying, calling, saying, yeah, get me going. I want to be out there. I don't want to sit at home anymore. Feel awesome. Good. Yeah. Are you? Susan, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I agree with Diana. We're seeing, I feel as if the giant ship is finally turning and we are doing a lot less of still cancellations as they happen, people get sick, but we're not disassembling trips anymore. We are actively starting to plan and design travel again, not just for 2021, but into 2022. Um, and like Diana said, our phones have definitely uh, started ringing, the emails have come in more over the last couple of months. So I'm optimistic too. I think that we're moving into that that travel zone that we've been used to over the last few years. Excellent. And Lainey? Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I think that my sales are actually better than uh, they've ever been in the 10 years I've been in business. Um, but a lot of it is very last minute travel. So people are holding off because they don't know what the regulations are going to be. So they're waiting to make sure they can go someplace and then they just want to go next week. But uh, so it, it's been a very interesting time to be in travel because it's so much uh, last minute just exciting, interesting trips to plan. And so that leads me into the next question. What are some of the lessons learned due to the crisis at hand? Who wants to respond first? Who would love to jump in there? Any I'll jump in. Okay, Lane, go ahead. I was just going to say probably the biggest lesson I've learned is that travel protection is extremely important. Um, I've had almost every single client use travel protection on the trips that they've been um, going on recently. Yeah. And Diana? 
Yeah, I think the biggest lesson that I learned was to protect the investment of time and energy I've made with clients, even if they end up canceling. So, you know, I, I've been in business since 1999. And in those 20 years, I would say I was really lucky. And I didn't know that until 2020 and the bottom fell out. And not only did I, you know, not have to undo everything I had done for the last 18 months, but of course, all of my commissions went away. And more importantly, for those custom travel programs that I had put together, you know, people traveling in Vietnam or Thailand or, or, or you know, I don't know, Cartagena, you know, Patagonia, those people, those were custom trips. And in some cases, I had taken uh, the credit cards, you know, to pay the, the DMC over in, in Bangkok or, or down in Santiago. And of course, you know, I had used, uh, I, I had to pay those credit card fees. Um, all of my commission went away, my fee didn't get paid, and I just realized, okay, we have to change this, you know, and for something now that I do that's curated travel, I make really sure that everybody gives me a non-refundable deposit, even if the DMC isn't asking for that, now I do it, or the DMC says it's a $300, you know, uh, um, non-refundable deposit my client gets told it's a six hundred dollar non-refundable deposit and and thus if i've sent out spent all this money and, and somebody gets sick or whatever i have a little bit i have a little bit for my time and expertise and as i said i feel like i was lucky over those 20 years and, and of course who could have ever predicted a pandemic but uh lesson learned you know i i lost not only commissions but as i said credit card fees you know that i had paid and obviously those didn't come back it was tough yeah, that's an excellent point. And I've spoken to a lot of travel advisors who have now started doing that because they learned their lesson. Yeah, it was a hard mm -hmm. lesson to learn, but yeah. And Susan? We, you know, 2020 was great. And I've only been in the industry since 2014. And what was great for us is we grew quite big, quite fast. And what it allowed us to do is give us a step back and really look at our business and examine the business. An opportunity we may never get again, certainly hopefully not under these circumstances we have, but we did two major things. Is one, we, we really curated our clients. We looked across our client list and realized that we wanted to work with clients we know, we respect, we enjoy, who respect us, value our time, understand the value that we provide. We're working in difficult times and that established trust was really critical for us to have with our clients. And so we're taking on very few new clients and working right Right now exclusively with a group of clients we've already had but it also allowed us much of what diana and laney have said is you know we work smarter not harder we started looking we like i always say we like to work in the business but we don't like to work on the business and what 2020 allowed us to do sort of forced us to do was to get our houses in in really strong order and that's everything we've always had um, travel insurance as a part of what we offer. However, we really beefed up our liability forms. We uh, talked about, had good conversations with clients about why we're charging the fees, why our fees have increased and why we charge cancellation fees. And we've also had time to invest in our staff. So these were some things that really helped grow our business. I think will help grow our business coming out of it. And I think we'll be better because of that and smarter and more particular about who we're working with. Yeah, it's amazing how this crisis, you know, created so many opportunities to be able to do that, which is great. So we're stronger on the other side of it, right? You know, that's excellent. Those are amazing points. Um, so uh, what does luxury travel mean in today's new travel landscape? How has this crisis changed how you sell and, and what it means, what luxury travelers are looking for? I don't know who's the first one who wants to respond to that. Well, I'll, I'll say that in my client, you know, the, the base of clients that I work with, those people that traveled this fall, the ones who were the first to come back and they, you know, they were definitely high in clients. I would say, well, you know, we're going to do this nice trip to Barcelona. I have this lovely hotel. Fine. No, no, requ no request to, you know, price like a different price points. It's like, that's good. I'll take that. And, you know, we're going to do this nice day trip to Corona. And my DMC offered, you know, a, uh, a nice, incredible chef, you know, cooking experience up there. What? We want to do that. I'm like, they did That was offered to them. So that was very interesting to me. Like, luxury travelers are like, yeah, I want that. I want the great experience. 
Yeah, I'm not so worried about the cost. I mean, I'm sure you know nobody spent any money on anything last year, so they've got it there, you know. And so when the when a nice offer something they haven't thought about is presented to them they're like uh-huh yeah sure no problem want the check want the credit card yeah <laughs> laney yeah i would say that luxury in today's market is really about customer service and it's about pampering and it's about feeling that you are stress-free in your travel and everything is taken care of it can be a tent, it can be one night in a hotel, it, it can be a 20 day, you know, amazing luxury trip. But it, if it doesn't have that element of just pure customer service and being taken care of and being pampered and feeling special, um, I, I think you're missing what luxury really is these days. Excellent. Yeah. We're, we're finding very simply that it's everything from when people were able to start traveling again, saying, I just want somebody to make my cocktail, make my dinner, make my bed. That's it. You know, <laughs> and the making the bed, I'm like, eh, that might not happen. It might happen. <laughs> you know, but we're also finding that it's people are realizing um, to travel today, not someday. Um, they've stopped saying, you know, oh, when a few years down, they're saying that's got to happen now because I'm not getting any younger. My kids are getting older and we don't know how this is going to affect in, and change in a year. And then we're also seeing people really, the multi-generational travel is strong for us. We are seeing families reconnect in ways. We're seeing retired couples who were even going to take a vacation just for themselves, very high end, saying, nope, the whole family's got to come now because those connections are really valuable, knowing they haven't seen their grandchildren for a while. And uh, we're also see, seeing people book longer, um, higher category rooms and spending more. But the number one thing we are seeing is we are seeing private aviation being considered in ways that were never considered before. It wasn't even an option. And we just kind of floated out there and we're amazed at how many people are really starting to do that, which has its own issues, as we know, with the supply and demand, but private aviation has been a real increase for us. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard from many of the advisors and the um, experts also I spoke with for the travel trends report, that aviation. And also another thing that I've heard are villas. Are people still looking for the villas, you know, so that they can have their own little bubble, so to speak? You're seeing a lot of that still? Does anybody want to jump in? We are more tied to resorts. Um, you know, they want the access a little bit and they want that. Um, but we are still seeing that. And again, that goes back to the multi-generational travel. They want to be together. And I think the connection is the key part there. The villa is the way to facilitate that. But private aviation is the way to get them there. You know, the nice hotel and the service is what helps facilitate a great time so they don't have to worry about that. And then a valuable travel advisor who's overseeing all of that, making sure everyone's taken care of, can get over there, can get home and have as, you know, a great experience while managing expectations while they're there. Lainey? Yeah, I'm, I'm also seeing um, people who really like that social distancing, either through um, over the water bungalows where you're all by yourself, um, but they want the butler service and they want the service still. So while they might want the villa, they still want it fully staffed. Excellent. And um, one thing I heard from a panel discussion actually at Virtuoso was um, trip stacking. So, you know, you have several trips at a time during the same time period and one of them might not happen, but you have that other one as a backup. But that doesn't mean that the other one is completely eliminated. You just put it toward future. Is everyone, everybody's nodding their heads. So I'm guessing everybody's seeing that as well. Does anyone you want to speak to that? Well, what I find interesting is that um, I've had clients who've called me and said, I want to do this, but yeah, I'm going to also be talking to you about this this coming summer. Um, so people sort of laying it out there, they haven't booked it with me, but like, yeah, I, I definitely want to be doing that. So it's not just one thing. I mean, I have people who are going to see the Christmas markets in December. Again, very last minute booking, but you know, top hotels. They were supposed to go to uh, Capri, stay at the Kisasana in, uh, I guess, September of 2020. That didn't happen, obviously. And that also didn't happen this year, even though I offered it to them. They weren't ready for that with the family. 
but they're going to the Christmas markets and I'm I'm really sure they're gonna come back and say, yep, we also want that Capri tour, you know, Capri vacation in September. So it's down the road, but it's like, they're getting started now. It's just not one for the year. So like maybe two or three for the year. Wow, excellent. And you're both nodding. So obviously Susan and Lainey, you seeing it as well. Excellent. Um, so, during a crisis, obviously, luxury travels are the ones to lead the pack and are the first to travel. Have you seen that with this crisis and how has it been different from past crises where the luxury travelers were the first? Does anyone want to speak to that? Amy, Diana, anyone? Yeah. You know, I think I've been in business longer than you guys have because I started in 1999. And when I first started, actually, you know, there was the Gulf War, there was 9-11, and then there was SARS. So that was at the very beginning of, you know, my, my business. But at the same time, nothing since then has compared to what we just went through. So I don't think even I, you know, if I'd been, been, been in business before that wave at around, you know, 1999, 2000, maybe I could speak to that. But no, I haven't had anything. I haven't had anything like this. Lainey? Um, I, I would say I'm seeing a big generational difference in who's who's ready to travel and who's going. Um, I think it has been very difficult for seniors. Um, people over 70 has has really been hit for my business and the young families. Um, they aren't they hadn't been traveling as much. But the um, the people who are like 30 to 50, um, those are the people who I have as my majority who are going out and, and being the first to get out there and travel. Excellent, so the older millennials and Generation X, finally, Generation X. <laughs> <laughs> I speak about Generation X. Um, so is there, so for the ones who aren't traveling, Lainey, is it, are they worried, the older generation and the young, what, what's the reasoning for them not to be going, not to travel right now? Well, uh, vaccinations is an issue with some, there are some of them who um, can't physically take vaccination, so that's difficult for them. Um, and they're more concerned about getting sick and actually dying from it. The, um, and I, I just had a, a problem with, one senior man who just booked and the requirements now for getting on your smartphone filling out the forms having apps on your phone uh, he he was in tears he just it's too much for him he can't figure out how to do it he needs help um, i mean that's what i'm for but i'm not there with him on his phone with him um, so it, it's been very difficult for them I have to say that my, my experience is a little different than Lainey's. My, my travelers who have appeared so far are actually 60 and over, and they are vaccinated, you know, and maybe that's a difference because I live in New York and, and this is a high vaccination rate here. Yeah, no, seriously, you know, that, that could, be an, it could be one of the differences, but my clients are older. I, I have a couple of people going away at Christmas, but yeah, the issue with the children, you know, someone who's got a five-year-old and, you know, reluctant to put that child on a plane, um, but for people who are, you know, vaccinated and have free time, that's who I'm seeing is people over 60. Yes. And even, so, you know, even older. So. I, I tend to agree with Lainey, who we're seeing is in that age range, but we're also finding it's the intrepid traveler. So like Diana, we have clients who are definitely in their 60s and 70s, but they're extremely well traveled. They are this is their passion, this is what they're going to do and what they value, and it's just a matter of being able to get everything that they need in order to go travel. They are vaccinated, they are going, and if they're not vaccinated, they realize that they're gonna be very limited as to where they can go. So for the most part, ours are vaccinated, well-traveled, and really run the gamut. We're even seeing families, I mean, my own family, uh, my children are, are 10 and 12, just turned 10 and 12, and we're not eligible for vaccination this summer. And my husband and I made a very concerted effort to go to Grenada. We found, you know, where they had strong requirements. We knew we weren't going to be able to leave the resort. So also making those individual decisions, too. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a factor for a lot of us and giving them counsel and talking them through it. So does everyone feel like they've become medical experts during this last year and a half? No, in fact, no, but I, I know you're joking, Paloma, but I actually don't want to even go there. In fact, all of my documents say 
you are responsible for this. I will talk to you, you know, as, as, as best I can. This is what I understand you need to do to go to England. This is what I understand you need to go to Italy, whatever. But in that conversation, I am also saying, you need to comply. You need to be up to date because it could change. And, you know, in the same way that somebody says, what shots do I need to go to Chile? I am never the person who says, this is what you need. It's like, I recommend that you check the CDC website and then take a printout to your doctor and let them advise you. We have no business being medical experts about any of this. Very, very careful not to go there. Excellent. No, that's an excellent point. Lainey? Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I, I think that we are all about information and education, and we need to be the ones to make sure that they understand the regulations, understand what are the consequences if you're not vaccinated, uh, not your health consequences, but your travel consequences. And I think that's where we really need to focus. And Lainey, you mentioned to me that uh, you create a form before the, the clients go on. Can you talk, speak to us a little bit about what you do? So uh, I create itineraries for my clients that are online and they can access um, wherever they are, but I go through every requirement. So I make sure that I'm updated as to what the regulations are before they go. Uh, they know the date they need to go get tested. They know how to go get tested. Um, they need, they know what type of test to get. So I do this in written form and I also create videos uh, that I put on my YouTube channel and TikTok and other social media to show them how I travel firsthand so that they can see the process, which makes them feel a little more at ease when they go through the process themselves. Excellent. Is anyone else doing, I imagine, something similar? You want to speak to that, Susan? Well, we're at, we're not giving, we are, because the requirements are changing so much, we are really making sure they have the links, which we check and keep up with, but we have really tried to give them the tools to be able to look at this. And we do, like Diana was saying, we put that on them. In fact, we actually have them sign off on a COVID liability waiver. Um, there's a, there's a long list of things that they have to sign off on and, in some ways, it's almost like here's all the reasons why you shouldn't travel. But if you don't go, we'll help you go. It's a little bit of running the gauntlet, but we also, again, we want to make sure that the people we're working with understand what they're going into, and that there are there are non-refundable consulting fees, there are non-refundable deposits, and there are non-refundable cancellation fees. And at the same time, we're saying, but in order to protect yourself, here's the insurance you you know, here's an insurance option, here's a meta, meta, you know, MedJet option, and we've even offered COVAC Global, which allows if you've only, uh, if you test positive and have one symptom, you can be medically evacuated. So we've given them all of those options to insure themselves. Unfortunately, some don't take it. I just had a client yesterday, supposed to leave on a trip, and daughter was diagnosed with COVID two days before and they lost all their money because they chose not to insure even though we had the forms and a conversation. So that's that's where we are. Give them the tools and resources that we can. And for, um, or maybe it's on your own travels or with uh, clients, what are some of the biggest challenges you've seen that, or that they've called you and there's an emergency and you know, does it any, Anybody want to speak to that? Like, well, they're on a trip. Is there a form? Is, oh my God, I'm, you know, what's going on? Like anything crazy that's happened, Lainey? Um, well, I just had an incident with my client who had been uh, told the day before his trip to Antigua that Antigua had closed down and they were going to shut down beaches. They were going to shut down all activities. He was supposed to go the next day. Um, and he wanted to change everything, change islands, change resorts in one day. Um, and that was after all the testing and everything and all the forms had been filled out. So you can't just turn it around in a day. There's so many different pieces that have to go into place. Uh, plus the resort was unwilling to let him do that. So um, it, this, this kind of thing is happening constantly <laughs> now, like every trip. I, my clients are going on, there's some snag. Um, luckily, another client had travel protection, had uh, all the flights are getting canceled. So flight was canceled, he couldn't get off the island. They didn't want to get him off the island for a week. Um, 
and luckily we got him a flight the next day and uh, he was covered by insurance for one night put him at the most luxurious wonderful resort um and they said it was the best night of their entire vacation they were <laughs> so happy to miss their flight <laughs> Um, so a little bit of the glamorous side of travel. What are some of the most fabulous experiences uh, you ladies have put together for your clients who wants to jump in? Well, I can share some things we actually did during COVID and I really give credit to our ground partners. I think for us, our success is really very strongly dependent on the, the trust and the expertise of our ground partners. And we had um, a group of intrepid travelers who had all been vaccinated and wanted to go to Columbia in May. And we were able to put together in five, I think it was actually four or five nights, an incredible experience working with a great ground partner who was able to put it together. And we had them sail along the coast from Cartagena up. Um, they were able to helicopter up to some remote villages. And during a pandemic, that is a real challenge, as you can understand, because pilots had to be tested. Each client had to be tested to make sure they're not spreading this to you know these remote villages. So the level of detail that we got down to, on top of that, our ground partner put it together in under two weeks while she was expecting a baby, had the baby during the whole process. So really wow. being able to the whole gamut of how it came off as really this very well-traveled um, family and their friends, one of the best travel experiences. But again, ground partners and working with them. Yeah, you know, I had, um, uh, there was a family in our town with a daughter living up in Anchorage and uh, the daughter was getting married. And so there were several families that were going to go up there and, and attend this wedding. And they were, and several of them had booked themselves on a cruise that got canceled because, you know, for whatever reason, you know, uh, Lynn Black wasn't going to operate. And, and with about three weeks notice, these people all came to me. They hadn't all booked that Lindblad cruise, cruise for me, actually. They would booked it independently, but suddenly, you know, they were out and they had plane tickets. And so, you know, these people went on, a, on an uncruise. These people went to Brooks Camp. These other people went down to Seward for three days. We did all of that. And, and yeah, to Susan, Susan's point, having a ground operator that can scramble and do things on very short notice is everything and they all came back like ah oh, that was incredible one had never been on a cruise before she, she did the on cruise loved it i loved it i, I signed up for another one I'm like cool <laughs> you know? but you know when i called the uh the people in alaska i was like and and it's in two weeks time <laughs> she's like oh god <laughs> but 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 it got done you know and they all used those plane tickets and they all went to alaska not in the way they had thought but they did a bunch of things they went to do you know whale watching they went to do you know they did a bunch of things they were going to do on their cruise they just did it from land so again the the partner is everything partners everything and laney yeah yeah i i would totally agree i think having a dmc that you can trust in every country is just uh, so invaluable I have um, recently sent people to Costa Rica and Montenegro to do just these really custom private kind of tours where they're taken all over the country, adventures, um, and, and it wouldn't be half as good without that partner on the ground who is there overseeing everything and understanding the location. Um, and I do, I'm having a lot of people who want to do their bucket list trips. So um, many of them want to go to French Polynesia, do the over the water bungalows, the Brando Resort, one of my favorite resorts. Um, those kind of over the top adventures are um, what I'm seeing a lot of right now. And um, I hear those bucket list trips are becoming to do trips now, or is everyone hearing yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, as I said earlier, these people who went to Spain, you know, it's a simple trip to Barcelona, six nights, and my DMC offered a whole bunch of things, and then it was a pretty hefty price tag, and they were like, yep, we want that. That's great. You know, why not? Why not? So that's a good thing. The, oh, sorry, something caught my eye, but, um, and the, which destinations are, is everyone wanting to go with these to-do trips or has it changed from pre-pandemic? 
what's going on in terms of the, the destinations and what's trending? I think the volume for us that where people are wanting to go, like Lenny said, French Polynesia has become very attractive, but it's also been a place that's open and people are able to go. Um, Italy is always going to be, you know, one that they enjoy, but the Middle East is interestingly enough, which is one of my favorite areas of the world has really gotten to be Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. These are places we are seeing being asked for. Um, not so much South America at the moment because it's still just opening up and people are watching that, but Europe certainly is coming back. Africa's coming back, the Middle East for us and French Polynesia. Uh, Lainey? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the biggest thing that I have seen as a change is Asia is not quite there yet. That um, I think there's still a little fear about going to Asia and it's not open a lot of it but um otherwise yeah the whole world people want antarctica you know they want arctic they they want the most exciting adventures that they can get right now you know it's interesting I, i've always sold a lot of europe i mean that was my first you know specialization and still my strongest thing and and to your point you know my my lovely southeast asia destinations which i'm you know specialist in and also australia new zealand which i love just not possible. So the people who are traveling, it's been France, it's been England, it's been Spain, it's been Italy, it's been Germany, Austria, all of these things. Um, it's Europe. For, for me, it's Europe. You know, custom travel to Europe. Excellent. And um, obviously customization, which is what you guys do prior to the pandemic, was huge. But now people even want it more personalized, more customized is what I'm hearing. Can anyone speak to that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like, you know, private transfers, private tours, you know, no no airport bus in, you know, we're not doing that. I'll, you know, I'll even take, not even a taxi, I want the private transfer, for sure. And um, I know you were talking earlier, uh, one of you, about, uh, you know, private villas, things like that. Yeah, there's that, but it's just, you know, I, I was on a trip to Switzerland myself for vacation in August. I always post a lot of pictures. And I post a lot of pictures and, and Switzerland, I mean, I don't think I've ever had as many comments as I did on that trip, not only during my trip, but after I got back, people stopping me on the street saying, I loved your pictures. And I think that Switzerland was presenting itself as, you know, non-political, non-COVID, outdoorsy, eternal, the Alps. You don't have to think about Democrats, or Republicans to love the Iger, you know, or the Matterhorn. And I think really people were responding to all of those things saying, I mean, I had three people say, I want to go to Switzerland. I've never used a travel agent before. I loved your pictures. I'll be calling you for Switzerland next summer. So yeah, outdoors, socially distanced, you know, naturally socially distanced, all those things. That's all in, in certain places favor. Yes, yeah, certainly. And the, the new catchphrase, room to roam, right? Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. wants room to roam. Um, so I just wanted to remind the audience that they can start sending in their questions and we'll be, you know, asking them from the panelists in just a few minutes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about luxury cruising. What have been some of the challenges in selling luxury cruising and new opportunities in selling luxury cruising? Who would love to speak to that? Lainey? Um, well, I just got back from Greece um, on an Azamara cruise, which was their test cruise before the revenue cruises. Um, and it was fabulous. Um, I think that having a lower passenger rate occupancy really makes service better. It makes um, it easier to handle for protocols. It makes you feel safer. Um, so I'm seeing people want to do small ship cruising um, although there is still a hesitancy because when you're on a ship with all these people, um, if somebody gets sick, there is a feeling that it's going to ruin the entire cruise for you. Whereas if you're on a resort and somebody gets sick, they can get quarantined and they're, they're not going to ruin your vacation. So I think there's a, a fear of people not knowing if you're going to be able to dock, are you going to get stuck on a ship with sick people, uh, you know, all from the beginnings and how this all started. Um, but I think it's coming back and it's coming back strong. Um, Royal Caribbean just announced their, their 274 day world cruise, which is amazing. And someone in my network um, sold their highest 
uh, cruise suite for $775,000 um, this week. So if people want to do it, they're coming back strong. Uh, Susie, want to add I, something? I mean, I think cruising, you know, I think like what Lainey said, the hesitancy is the uncertainty of what will happen. But I, I think the smaller lines and the luxury lines I've been listening to, Seaborn, Silver Sea, Regent, have really done a great job communicating and holding sort of their own town halls about what they're doing. And after listening to a lot of it, I feel like it's probably one of the more safe places to be because they do have extremely strong testing requirements to pre-board. Lynn Blad's another one who's doing a great job. They're only allowing passengers who are vaccinated. Um, they've also been, you know, you think about what they've dealt with with viral issues in the past. They, cruise lines are extremely well equipped to deal with these types of viral things and how to combat it. They've got a history of that. They're just adapting those protocols to this particular situation. Um, I actually think the biggest challenge, we had clients who just gotten back yesterday, and the only real challenge that they had was in Italy with their shore excursions in that they can't go anywhere in Italy, but that's Italy, not the cruise lines. They can't leave their cruise groups. And that was the only real complaint that they had. Service is great. Like Lenny said, there are fewer cabins that are filled. Um, and they're seeing a real eagerness in the staff to be able to take care of passengers again. Yeah. I think the one challenge here is that people who already are cruisers and love cruising, they're they're fine. You know, they're they'll as as you point out, Susan, you know, the top lines are saying everybody gotta be vaccinated. That's true for you know some of the top tours as well, right? Can't participate unless you're vaccinated. Um, so I think that's less of a problem than trying to persuade someone to try cruising for the first time at this time. That I have not to do. I feel like that floating petri dish, you know, metaphor is still around out there and that that's, you know, that's a holdover and that's going to take a while to dissipate. And so, you know, I've got a group going on uh, Uniworld College alumni group uh, next May. That's fine. It's a small ship. A bunch of those people have never done river cruise before, any kind of cruise before, and have said to me, I can't stand the idea of all those people on a big ship. You know, they haven't done a cruise. Okay. This is not the time to try to, I think, to try to persuade someone that's got that anxiety that they should do it, even though everything you said is true. You know, that they probably are, it's probably among the safest kinds of vacations you can take. And it's probably a much more controlled environment than what we face every day when we go to the grocery store, you know, or get your car washed and somebody sits in your car. I mean, truly, truly. But there's a, there's a hurdle to get over there. And I think that that's just going to take a little bit of time to get past. And so I'm happy to help my cruisers get on their cruises, you know, and, and have a, a really good experience and help them pick their short excursions. But I'm not trying to persuade anyone right now to do a big ship cruise who's who's fighting me from that point of view. This is that's a hard that's a hard thing to win right now. I think that's the real value of an advisor right now is to be able to, we're actually saying, I don't know that this is the right trip for you to travel to right now. I mean, that's us being honest. We're not trying to just make a buck. We're right. looking at it from a long-term perspective as far as relationships and you know, reestablishing or, or continuing the trust of clients, establishing the trust of new clients. And what Diana said is really important that we do that. And we do not, we look at this as a long-term, long-term game because it is, it's our business. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that one of the reasons why I'm successful and probably you both are successful also is because we don't look at it about what money I'm making. It's not about our commission. It's about what's best for the client and how to give them the most, the best experience possible without worrying about what we make. Um, I think that's a perspective that all uh, travel advisors should have so that we don't make the mistake of pushing products that are wrong for the client because then you're, you're gonna just lose that client. How do you, that brings me to another question, how do you engage with your clients? Do you um, have uh, phone conversations? How do you, you know, learn a little bit about them and what would be the ideal um, trip for them? Who wants to take, Susan, nodding your head? 
We actually have at Brownell, it's called the Discover More process. And it's probably like what many people do. We do not take on a trip. We start every trip with an in-depth phone call. Even if it's a client we've been working with for years, we start every one of our, and we talk through every aspect of it. We really, it's it truly is discovering what's important. At this point, it's should they be traveling? Are they comfortable traveling? It's sometimes just to feel you out at this point. But then it's all the way down to what will really make it special. We talk about with families. We want to give every person in the group a turn. We want everyone to have some sort of unique experience that they are going to be excited about. So it runs the gamut of that, but it's an in-depth conversation. Actually, I have a business partner and she and I do it together because we both look at two very different perspectives and it's, it's, it's incredibly valuable and it gives the client a comfort and us a comfort that they should go to this location or they shouldn't travel at all, or maybe another location. And how surprised are the younger people when they receive a phone call? <laughs> That's yeah, really. <laughs> Like, what is this? Lady? Not a text. That's what actually what I was going to say because most of my clients are younger and they don't like those phone calls. <laughs> they, they like to text me, they like emails. Um, sometimes I, I speak by phone, but it's actually pretty rare that I, I speak on the phone with clients. Most of the time it's messaging, texting, or uh, email. Oh, interesting. And I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm, I'm on the phone all the time. You know, like like Susan. That's the first thing we do. In fact, you know, these people that that uh, emailed me before the program started about going to Florence in in uh, January. I said I'm a, I'm about to be on a panel, so I'm tied up for a little while. But can we speak at three o'clock today? Because they're new. They're a referral. Almost all my business is repeat referral. I, I really don't have to advertise. It's repeat referrals. So they're already inclined to work with me. But I certainly don't feel that I can take on somebody new without speaking to them. You know, so, I mean, I have clients all over the country. I have a whole cluster out in Seattle. I have a cluster in Indianapolis. I'm in New York. There are people that I will maybe never meet, but that doesn't mean that I don't know them. I do. I have to know them. We all have to know who our clients are. And, and Lainey, I'm amazed you can do that. Good for you, you know, for texting. But I, I have to talk to people. And that's where we start. I need to know what you're looking for. Who are you? What's your travel style? You know, email is great, but it only goes so far. And sometimes people tell you something on the phone. They don't even know they're telling you. You're like, okay, that's important, you know. Interesting. Yes, everybody has their own ways of being successful. So um, one last question before we start getting to the audience's question. So all challenges create opportunities and this crisis has really shown travelers the importance of travel advisors. So what should your colleagues do to make sure travelers understand how important travel advisors are now and into the future once you know we start getting out of this crisis? Who would like to speak to that one first? Uh, you know, I, I think, oh, go ahead, Lane. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is, well, first of all, summing up what we've been talking about, you know, the importance of our advice in terms of this is what the requirements are. These are the links for you to get there. It's a different time. You know, you need to be on your game in terms of what you're going to expect when you get there. But at the same time, during the uh, pandemic, you know, in the early days when I was unwinding everything that I had done, because I have really strong relationships with hoteliers and tour companies, and because I can play a game on those airline tickets and refunds and how you get them and, and you know, when, you, when you want to cancel, not right away. Um, you know, almost everybody that I worked with got a refund from a hotel, even non-refundable hotels sometimes even booked through beds online, you know, everybody that with, with a few exceptions um, that were on, on flights that got canceled, the airline things that got canceled, they almost all got refunds. Sometimes I had to pursue it for 10 months like I did with one airline that was, you know, they're supposed to fly in June. I think we got the refund in March, but they got it. You know, I wasn't going to forget about it. So I just don't know why you wouldn't want to have an advocate who speaks with a bigger voice when there's a problem because travel is by definition going to include some unexpected things. You know, we try to manage everything you can before you go, like so that whatever happens on the trip is not that big and can be handled. But somebody who is doing it for themselves, they don't even know what they don't know. And so, I, you know, having an advocate is to me, where you start, it doesn't cost, well, maybe it costs a little more because you pay a fee. I mean, you should pay a fee, 
Um, but aside from that, you know, the supplier shouldn't be charging any more. And to me, it's a no-brainer. Lainey, you were going to say? Um, so as advice for other travel advisors, <clears throat> yeah. um, I, I think a hurdle that many people have to get over is tooting your own horn. Um, it's very important that you point out when you do something amazing. So you can do this by posting on social media. Um, there was a time when I went to the airport to change somebody's ticket because I couldn't get through because there were hours of wait on the phone. So I took a video of myself at the airport getting this, this ticket changed and posting that on your social media shows this is why you have a travel advisor. They go above and beyond for you. Excellent point. And Susan, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, a little bit to Diana's point too, the relationships we have with suppliers. Yeah. That's something that in hoteliers and airlines, that is something that we are going to have far more influence in helping in a situation, whether you're stuck over there, whether you are trying to get a refund, whether there's been some emergency. Again, it goes back to the relationships with our suppliers, our personal relationships that we are calling someone we know, and it's not you know, just this individual person trying to get through and trying to find help. And I think that's become more and more important than ever in this situation because people really realize anything can happen. And then I would go back to just saying that people don't know what they don't know. The fact that people were traveling without travel insurance, I, I you know, and hearing Diana say, I got lucky all those 20 years, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that strokes me <laughs> out. I mean, our, our people, I mean, I tell everybody, I pay for travel insurance just like you do, and I buy it for every single trip and understanding you know, this I get I have a long list of scenarios of what actually has happened um, in different cases, true stories about why we have that. So it's again, it's that advice and protection for your overall trip in in addition to enhancing that experience. Yeah, I, I guess I would just build on that, Susan. Also, the enhancement. Again, the the people who went to Barcelona, they said, well, we like to do a cooking class. And they came back and, you know, because my DMC offered this thing, she described it as magical. She used the word magical. That was a magical day. You know, like, are they coming back to me? Yeah, because I gave them something they didn't know to ask for. And that's what I'm always trying to do is offer them something they don't even know they can do. Swimming with your elephant, you know, Thailand. Pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm going to jump on to the audience questions. Uh, one of the first ones we have is, in addition to everything you already have provided in terms of insight, would you share tips, strategies for travel advisors that are entering the luxury market to be successful in this market? That's a big one. <laughs> so a few tips. Anybody want to jump in? I'll say something, and this is not very glamorous, and again, it goes back to working on the business and not just in the business, but I think having a really strong, your administrative part of it, a really strong project management system, um, being able to get all of your waivers, your terms and conditions, get all of those housekeeping things in order, and that really sets a foundation to be able to work not only effectively but efficiently and when you have effective and efficient systems it frees you up to be able to sell more um and then i would say too as soon as you get to a certain level you know for us hire hire a good you know travel coordinator travel assistant whatever you want to call them and really help them do some of that administrative work that will free you up again to be on the phone or on emails with clients to develop your business. Lainey? Um, I would also say if you're starting out, experience. Go on the luxury vacations yourself. If you don't go on these, you won't understand how to sell them. You won't understand the market. You won't understand the people who go on these trips. So experience and learn. Excellent. That's and an excellent I would point. Add, I would add um, something that I would call, you know, keep your eyes on the prize. That if you want to sell in the luxury market, then you need to sell the luxury market and don't waste time with the people who come through your door who are not going to be a luxury client. You know, when somebody says to me, I don't really care where I, where I stay, it's just a place to sleep. It's like, I'm sure you're a really lovely person, but you're not my client. 
You know, be really clear. Who is your client? What what do they care about? And pursue that and do not get distracted by the stuff that just takes up a lot of time and, and has very little return. You know, it's really important to separate. And when you're starting out, it can be tempting to take everybody who comes across your door. But as I said, if you're just spending time with people who you either waste it or they don't want to spend enough to have a great vacation, you know, they don't have to be a movie star, but they have to be willing to spend something. Then you get people who come back and they're not happy because they wanted a five-star vacation, but they were only going to pay for a three-star one. So then you don't get a referral, you know, for somebody who's going to have the true four and a half to five star vacation. So again, very simple. Keep your eyes on the prize. Excellent points. Excellent points. So another question is, do you think Mexico has some destinations that would be considered a luxury destination? Oh, yeah. Sure. Definitely. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <That's the> <laughs> yeah. Everything from, I mean, I think that can be very property driven. I mean, I think it can also yeah. be experience driven. Um, we have had clients in San Miguel. Oaxaca is, you know, a place, everything in, in addition to Los Cabos, Riviera Maya. I think that is really Tulum. There's so many places that I think have a luxury. But again, I think that is, can be very experiential as well as location. Yeah, I agree. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned having a great DMC um, is so important. How have you found your most valued DMC partners? Who would like to speak to that? Well, we have, you know, anyone who's in a consortium will have uh, vetted on location partners. And so if it's, you know, a place that you yourself have not worked in before, that's where you go. Your consortium, you know, has done some of that work before you so that you know that this is a legitimate partner. They're going to do what they say they're going to do. And then, of course, the more you're in the business, the more you talk to other people. And even if your consortium doesn't have a supplier that you really like, that doesn't mean that the person you meet at your conference or at LTM in Cannes or any place else doesn't say to you, Croatia, these people are great, you know, so talking, know, being in the business, knowing, uh, knowing your colleagues and, and who has a business model that looks like yours and, and getting referrals that way. Lainey? Yeah, I was going to say when, when you are in this business, it's all about networking and it's about learning um, from people who are in the business, finding hoteliers who you trust. And a lot of the hoteliers uh, will tell you, I really like this DMC. Um, or you just find some great reviews of clients who you trust. So there is research involved in networking is really important in this um, market, I'd say. Excellent. And for us, there's two different avenues we've really used. One is Brownell. And if you're part of a hosting agency, this is something to look into. But Brownell actually has a preferred partners program where they, they really do spend a lot of time vetting partners so that we know that we're going to work with people that are going to prioritize our requests, who are going to work with us, who are financially stable, and um, as well as just, you know, really have the right, um, maybe the right the very similar ways of working. So that's one area that I use within my own agency. And the other is I'm a Condé Nast top travel specialist, my business partner and I are. So we really network a lot with our Condé Nast um, colleagues who have been chosen in that. And we find again that we share information across the board and have very similar clientele who we can figure out or be able to choose from them. Then we may have a number of people to choose from, but it's actually being able to match the right client with the right DMC wherever they are. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is, and you three have mentioned this, but when selling luxury travel, do you find your personal trips posted to your website or social media account accounts bring in the most traffic? Lynn? Uh, for me, definitely. I'm, uh, I have over 17,000 followers uh, on my social media accounts and my personal trips is what gets me clients. When you use YouTube, which I use video a lot, um, Google My Business, a lot of these, uh, LinkedIn, a lot of these networks um, are searchable. 
So when somebody searches for, for a specific destination, those are gonna come up. Instagram isn't searchable like that, um, but so you have to be kind of choosy about where you post things, um, make sure you have really good descriptions, and definitely post your own travels because that shows your experience. It shows that you know how to sell it and you know the destination. Yeah, there's nothing like when we go on a trip and we get to know the destination, we can, our, our copy is so much better because of that, of course. Yeah. Um, so here's mm -hmm. a cute um, remark. I want a cup of that coffee with Lainey. Great size. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I have to have my, my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, one lady uh, or one uh, travel advisor remarked, as an agent newer to the luxury market, I tell my satisfied clients that the best way to thank me is to refer me. That has been working very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Repeats and referrals. I mean, I think that there's some statistic about how much more money and time it takes to acquire a new client than to, you know, keep working with one you already have. And uh, that's certainly true for me. When somebody is a referral to me, I'm not worried that they're kicking the tires, you know? Their friend Sally already went to Italy and she loved it. And these people, are, they're either gonna go to Italy with me or they're not gonna go. So um, that's a very, I, I save a lot of time with, you know, with not having to deal with people who are just kind of shopping. Um, there's one, are there travel advisors, sorry, in luxury willing to hire part-time newbies or must you be full-time? Oh, definitely part-time, right? Particularly, you know, as Susan was saying about getting an admin, you know, to help you. Absolutely, yeah. I, my, my admin is part-time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question, when using destinations uh, DMC, are you using their itinerary tools and adding on your own advice reminders? Depends, for us it depends. For the most part, we're using our own itinerary tool that we do have our Africa, one of our Africa DMCs, we use theirs because it's just so good and there's no need to duplicate that. So I think it's really dependent on that. But for the most part, we're using our own, like what Lainey had talked about, where they've got an app online to be able to access everything, can be updated in real time as things change. But it's really important, again, and this goes to Lainey's point about, you know, doing the travel yourself, because all of my clients get a document that, you know, whatever their destination is, is full of my tips that's going to make it better. You know, it's not going to be in a guidebook, but I think you're going to like this. You know, you might want to check that out. So they all get that. I don't I, I know that some of them don't read it because they're not readers, but that doesn't mean they don't get it. They all get that. And sometimes it's, you know, 10 pages long if they're really doing a custom trip for, you know, three weeks through Italy. Yeah. I mean, why would I not share, you know, the things, the, the little things that will just make it their life a little easier when they're there? And so we have time for one last question. Um, how do you tell a person that you don't want to work with them if you don't think they are going to be a luxury client? Who would like to respond? Uh, we we actually have a number of responses. <laughs> um, <laughs> we call it the gracious no is what we call it because it is not always the right fit for both us and for the client. So we really it really depends. It might be that they're kind of what Diana was saying is that you know they're not the right fit for for us and we just we often will give them maybe some um, links to you know a Viator tour or maybe even a context tour and say these are great resources for what you're looking for. Um, we also just go back and explain what, you know, what we do and that, you know, if they look at something they want to do in the future that might meet these needs, that we're happy to talk with them again. And we're very careful because, it, like Diana and both Lainey have said, those referrals are really important and someone may have referred them, but it just doesn't always mean it's the right fit. And sometimes we just use this. We don't know that this is the right fit for us. Sometimes it's workload. We just are not able to take on the work at this time. Call us later. Excellent. And Lainey? Um, so I'm a little different than you two and that I don't turn a whole lot of people away. I, I, I really take care of as many people as I can possibly take care of. Um, there, there are very few times when somebody is just not a right fit for me. And I explain at that point that um, how I work and what I do and that maybe it might be better for them in this one instance to book direct.
but um, for the most part, I take whatever I can get. So I'm a little different in that arena. And, uh, so, oh, sorry, Diana, yeah. No, I was just gonna say that the one thing we really haven't talked about at all, and I think is a really helpful qualifier is having a travel planning fee. And you know, when somebody says to you, oh, uh, I'm gonna have to talk with my husband or wife about it. It's like, they're not coming back, that's fine. I've given them my 10 to 15 minutes where I sample you know, my, my wares, like I'm showing off what I know. And at the end of that initial conversation, it's like, I don't know if Sally told you, you know, I have this travel planning fee and it is this, and you know, we, it's not enforced right now because we're just talking, but if you want to work with me, we have to agree that the fee is there. And they say one of two things, right? You know, you want to check today, which I don't require, or I have to talk with my, you know, spouse. And it's like, fine. That, that, that weeds out so many people. Having the fee, you should do it for your own self-respect anyway, but it really gets rid of people who are not gonna, you know, if you're not willing to pay a fee to somebody who's really good at their job, then you're definitely not my client. Yeah, Lainey, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I mean, I totally understand where you're coming from and I wish I had that, I don't know if it's self-respect, but um, I, I don't charge a fee. And I, I even have a difficult time trying to say the words like, that I charge a fee. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a hurdle I have to try to get over, but I, um, I've i never charged anything uh, for my clients. And that's part of what I tell them is that it's not, it's for me, it's not about a fee, it's about getting them what they want. Um, but I totally understand and I know that that's the way m the majority of agents uh, or advisors um, do it. So I have to learn from you, I think. <laughs> give me a call, I'll give you the language. I'll show you how it works, it's easy. It's really easy. <laughs> and so I do have one last question and it is for Susan. Who is the Africa DMC that is that good? <laughs> Um, they're called Africa Inscribed, and they're actually a part of Condé Nast, but we've known them for many years. Um, and a gentleman by the name of Dylan Harris uh, runs it, and he's just probably my favorite in the world, my best in the world, frankly. But That's Africa good. Inscribed. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so, so much for Susan, Diana, and Lainey for um, providing so much expertise on the subject of luxury travel. And thank you, audience, for joining us today and for listening to these lovely ladies provide all of their expertise. And thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.